The Adventures of Christopher Wells program, formerly scheduled at this time, is now broadcast at a new time on Tuesday evenings. Tune in for The Adventures of Christopher Wells next Tuesday and every Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You were standing at the doorway of a cabin on Cashier Creek. Up on the ridge, the bloodhounds have caught your scent. And between you and a fortune, between you and escape, yawn the white jaws of a deadly cottonmouth. Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the worn-out acres of a poor white trash farmer somewhere in the southern mountains in Irvin S. Cobb's great tale of vengeance, Snake Doctor. This story is about snakes and two men. One man was afraid of snakes and the other wasn't. The one who wasn't was known along Cashier Creek as Snake Doctor. His cabin was near the creek bottom land where there was a powerful lot of cottonmouths. And he earned his meager living by rendering down their soft fats, bottling the oil and selling it. For everyone knew there was no remedy for rheumatism like snake oil. Snake Doctor was harmless enough. But there were folks who honestly believed that he was a colleague of Beelzebub just because he wasn't afraid of snakes. And that's not all they believed about him. Now, uh, the man who was afraid of snakes was Jafe Morner, who was Snake Doctor's nearest neighbor. Jafe was the kind of man we all know who suspected, feared, and hated anything he didn't understand. And he understood neither Cottonmouths nor the Snake Doctor. In short, Jafe was ornery, ignorant, and shiftless. He'd rather shoot squirrels and chop cotton. He'd rather fish than hoe corn. And that's just what he's doing now, fishing down at the big hole with his son and heir, Finney, who's old enough but not quite bright enough to handle a gun. <laughs> Missed him, doggy. Benny, you blame fool. I told you not... He gets in the creek. What? The cotton mouth. Tramp on him in front the of you. The cotton mouth? Where the vermin? Honestly, You vermin. got him. You got him. Keep your foot on him while I fetch a stick. You don't need to, son. Yeah, he's dead. Now, come here. How'd you hit anything of that rifle, Pa? I had a beat drawed on him right and you I couldn't... You darn fool. <laughs> Oh, Find Pa! Out a blame snake whilst I'm a fishing. Heck, you were sunning yourself not more than to there from you. How'd you like to get yourself bit? Won't be no fish around here till thunderation after all that racket. Well, come on, let's go home and get us some vittles. <laughs> Morner tossed his bait can into the creek and threw a stick after it. He stood there watching the stick drift slowly toward the big hole, where the creek widened behind a jam of driftwood. Jake watched as the eddy caught the stick and sucked it beneath the dam. Jafe was curious. He moved downstream a rod or two and waited, watching the water boil up from under the driftwood. But the stick didn't come up. That was strange. Must have caught under there in a tangle of water-soaked and sunken logs. Probably it'd stay there for months. Maybe stay there always. Jafe considered this, and an idea began to form in his slow mind as he and Finney started home. Hey, Pa, how much oil you reckon's in this one? Pa? Pa? What you jawing about, son? This old cotton man. How much oil Throw do you Throw it re- down. Throw it down? Why? I'm Throw it down like I say. I'll make oh, you wish... Oh, 
I was aiming on rendering the old cottonmouth's fat like the snake doctor does. Maybe sell it and make myself some money. I don't like the squirming things around me. But it's dead. Leave it where it dropped. Now, come on home. You were scared on cotton mouse, Pa? I know better than to get myself bit by him. Tip Bailey knowed a fella got himself bit once. And there weren't a drop of liquor for miles. So he goes to work and cuts open the live chicken and puts it by his leg where the bite was. And fella lived, too. Yeah. Reckon Mr. Rives ever gets himself bit, Pa? Handling cotton mouths like he does? Who? Mr. Rives. Who? Mr. Rives. That's old Snake Doctor's real name. Ma says I oughtn't to call him Snake Doctor. Never but... mind what your ma says. Nobody in my family's calling no snake-loving scum Mr. Rives. Heck, that's what I say. Well, I see it you do. Sure, Pa. You know, I could have made myself some money renting that cotton mouse fat down into oil. How much you reckon old Snake Doctor makes out in the oil he sells? I don't know. Tip Bailey says old Snake Doctor's got more than a thousand dollars hid away somewhere in his cabin. <laughs> more than that, most likely. Cussed old miser don't spend nothing. Ain't got nothing save that old rack of bones mare. Tip Bailey says whenever old Snake Doctor sets foot out in his place, he's got the granddaddy of all cotton mouths that he leaves out in the cabin to stand guard on his money. Uh. Tip Bailey says you see the old snake doctor, put him in his pocket. Live cotton mouse. Snake doctor ain't fitting to be alive itself. Oh, Ma says he ain't bad. Says he don't mean nobody harm. Your Ma better be careful who she's associating with. She says he don't have good sense. Had the fever too much, she says. You ever been in the snake doctor's cabin, Pa? I don't have nothing more than I have to to do with that snake loving hoodoo. Tip Bailey says he bet. Wouldn't be no task at all for some no good to poke around in the snake doctor's shack and find all the money and make off with it. Huh. Oh, this blame son done near rendering me down. Look at my head, full of sweat, Pa. Here, look it. Huh. See? Done near a gourd full of sweat come off me. Why it turned down that way, Pa? It's come on noon. Dinner be most ready. I'm gonna tell a snake loving hoodoo that there's some of them cotton mouths on the creek side of our deadening. Oh, heck, he knows that. I'm gonna tell him he's got my leave to catch him. You don't need to come along if you don't want it. Well, if you're going over to his place, I'd kinda like to see it my own self. <laughs> Paul, he ain't to home else he'd have showed himself by now. I reckon so. Can you see any of the snakes, I told Paul? you to keep an eye out for him. I bet it's in one of them chinks, Paul. I bet the money's I in one of them... I ain't looking for no money. Huh. Must be a dang snake itself living in a place like this. Paul, I know you ain't looking for any money, but if and you was, wouldn't you look in that chink right up there? Oh, uh, where, son? Right there, second log by the fireplace on the right. You see that there hole? Yeah. I reckon I would look up there. Well, since we're here. Might as well see for myself. Oh, I wouldn't be a mite surprised if old snake doctor... Pa, Pa, Pa. Huh? Somebody's out on the porch. It's a snake doctor. It... Was you looking for something, Chief Mourner? Uh, yeah, I, I was looking for you. I want you. Yeah. Yeah. Look here, you old hoodoo. What's the idea of sneaking up on folks who took the trouble to come all the way down here to do you a favor? Yes, sir. Like as not that old snake doctor had a dang moccasin squitching around in his pocket whilst he was talking to you, Pa. Did, did you mind how his eyes was when he come in? Yeah. Dang, if it wasn't blazing like, like when you run across a little rabbit or a cat in the dark. Skid me out of ten years' growth, dang, if it didn't. And did you mind I kept looking up at the wall where I said I bet he had the money between the chinks Finny. up there? Huh? Finney, don't you say nothing to your ma about us being at the snake doctor's place, you understand? Why should I, Just pa? don't. And don't you go nigh it again. Cuss old vomit, you'd have thought we was prowlers the way he acted. Finny, that you out there? Yup, Ma. 
Dinner about ready. Is Paul with you, Tom? Yeah. Have I time enough for dinner to go down the spring and get me some more cold water? Well, if you stir your thumb, Shaquille. Hurry it up, son. I'm hungry. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. Catch anything, Jay? How you think I can catch fish with Finny firing off my gun at cotton mouths all the time? Ain't this heat more than a body can bear? Yeah. And it cooler by the creek? No. Oh, that poor old Miss Rives come by here a spell ago. Mine and I shook to pieces with a chill. Oh, he come by, did he? Well, did he come in? Just for a minute. Just for a minute, eh? What'd he want? He wanted could I give him something for his ailment. He just about could drag one sour foot for the other. Barely could make it up here from this place. I reckon he must be down bed with the fever by now. I could tell by the touch it was rising in him when he left here and started back home again. I gave him a dose out in our butler's acre drops. I would have given him a little smidge and a liquor. Oh, I... you would, huh? Oh, please don't, Jay. <coughs> oh, don't throw <coughs> up me. <coughs> Poor old Miss Rives. <coughs> Mr. Rives. Mr. Rives. How many times I got to tell you that the old hoodoo's name is Snake Doctor? Oh, he don't mean nobody no harm. Him at its skin allows for its hide and tallow, and you calling him Mr. Rice. You'll be calling him Honey and Sugar next. Well, without I learn you better. Oh, please, Jay, please. Paid names, huh? Tail by the tatch, could you? Well, I aim to learn. <laughs> What's his name now? Well, what's your poor Mr. Rives' name now? Snake Doctor. Kizzy Mourner rubbed the ugly red welt on her scrawny arm and gave the frying pan full of sizzling side meat a hopeless nudge. She prayed that the weight of the vittles might take the edge off Jafe's temper. Finney slouched in from the spring and saw the mark on her arm. Pa been whomping you again, Ma? She didn't answer. What'd you do this time? She silently dished up the hogback and cornbread for two men, and while they sat at a table, she ate on her feet, serving them between bites, as was the custom in the Mona household. After dinner, Finney stretched out under the chinaberry tree and Kizzy sat on the porch fanning herself and dipping snuff with a peach twig, scouring it back and forth on her gums. Jafe took his ease on the floor of the back room, but he didn't sleep. One thing he'd seen that day and another thing he'd heard, he was adding them together. That stick that had disappeared under the log jam and the snake doctor's money. It was four o'clock before any of them stirred, and then Jafe spoke to his wife for the first time since noon. Where's that there vial of drinking liquor, Kizzy? By the window. You took it out in your pocket after you laid down. I ought to carry a vial of drinking liquor with me, Ma. I might get bit by an old moccasin as soon as Pa would. Well, you better not let me catch you. You find it, Jay? I just remembered I won't be needing to tote no spirits along with me while I'm going. I wouldn't take no chance, Jay. Just one cotton mouth bike. Cotton mouth's all down the slashes, else along a creek. Well, I'll be this evening it's up on Bailey's Ridge in the high ground. You fixing to go shooting? I aim to gun me a chance of young squirrels between now and dust time. Reckon I'll come along, Pa. You stay in here, son. Oh, dang it. Be steaming in the place when the rain comes down. Paul, you might be needing me. You stay t- here. Oh, Paul. And Kizzy set me up a snack of cold supper on the shelf. Likely I won't get back till it's plumb time. Jafe Marner turned north through his struggling cornrows, and in a minute he was lost from sight. He kept on for nearly a mile until he came to a wild red mulberry tree. Where mulberries are, they're bound to be squirrels. Very neatly, he shot two young greys through the head. But Jafe was a master marksman. 
And uh, unsuspected by any who knew him, Jafe had another quality denied most of his kind. He had an imagination. Today, it was in excellent working order. He tied the brain squirrels together and swung them over his shoulder. If needed, they would be his alibi. Then he sat down under a tree a while. Yeah, I got plenty of time. Don't need to get down to Snake Doctor's place at about dusk when he comes out to feed that swayback mare of his. <laughs> Mr. Vine. <laughs> He sat out two brisk thunder showers and the intervals between them. Then he started off in a wide arc down Bailey's branch along the skirts of Little Cypress Slash to the sunken flats edging Cashier Creek. Took more than an hour of careful traveling before he came to his destination, a screen of haw bushes, less than 50 yards behind the snake doctor's cabin. No matter how ailing he is, he'll get up and come out to feed that rack of bones mare, Mr. Rhymes. I'll learn him to go colleaguing around another man's woman. Jafe Mourner let his jealousy heat him to a white hatred. At this moment, he was avenging his honor, and thus was spared the embarrassment of admitting to himself that the real reason he was here was the snake doctor's money hidden behind the log by the fireplace. The home-wrecking, snake-loving vomit... Ten minutes from now, I'll chunk him down the big hole in a creek like I did that stick this morning. And he'll go down and never come out. And nobody will miss him. Nobody will know he's gone for at least by a week, maybe a month. And maybe if I get around to it, I might come back this way someday. Poke around that cabin of his. And... Jafe Mourner's speculations were cut short. The cabin door opened and a figure stepped out into the growing dusk and walked toward the stable. He saw the snake doctor's loppy old straw hat and his dark coat drawn over a pair of hunched, narrow shoulders. At this distance, he couldn't miss. And he didn't. The figure jerked backward and then went face forward. Jafe started for him, and then he stopped. His eyes bugged. His mouth formed a scream that he couldn't utter. His rifle dropped to the ground. He had just killed the snake doctor, killed him dead with a 32 caliber slug through the head. And there on his door sill stood snake doctor, whole and sound and staring at him. Jafe Mourner, what have you done? The scream came at last, for Jafe Mourner had seen the devil, this snake doctor who arose alive from his bullet riddled body. Jafe whirled and ran into the deep, darkening woods, whimpering like a whipped puppy as he tore through the brush. Escape. He must escape. He must get under the shelter of a sound roof, have the protection of four walls around him. So he ran and ran for hours. It was close to midnight when he came out on a dirt road a short distance southeast of his dead man. Beyond the next bend, he'd be inside a home. Then he stopped. Around the bend coming toward him was a joggling light, a lantern hanging on a buggy. Jake flattened himself in a clump of brush to hide until the traveler passed. And then, just as the rig was opposite him, he heard a call coming from the other direction. Oh, there. Oh, now, Siri. Oh, it's me, it's Davis Ware. Is that you, Tip Bailey? Yep. Open it out from the junction. Tolerable tired, if anyone should ask you. What brings you out this time of night, Davis? Somebody sick? Sick? Nothing. There's been hella popping in these here bottoms tonight. Steady, boy. Steady. Now, what you mean? A killing. That's what I mean. A dirty, cold-blooded killing if there ever was one. Don't say. Who's gotten killed? I'm a fixing to tell you. Um, it happened just around dusk time at old Snake Doctor's place. Yeah? Was him was killed? Now, just give me time now. Yeah? Yeah. It seems like Snake Doctor's been a chilling lately. Uh-huh. He's pretty bad off today. Yeah, I mean yesterday, and... So long about five o'clock, when the rain was a lulling a little bit, why, why, Miss Kitty Mourner, see, she, she footed it down from her place to his and fetching some physic with her. Had to play the hot vittles. Miss Mourner's a mighty thoughty one for doing things for folk. Uh, don't you want to hear this? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, seems like she, she wasn't afeard of the snake doctor's play. Well, I'd have been all over that. Well, pretty soon after she got there, seems like he tried to get up out of his bed to go feed that old crow bait nag of his. Uh-huh. Rain had started in again, but then it's pouring down hard, so... She, she made him stay where he was at, and she put on his old hat and throwed his old coat around her to 
keep off the rest of the wet, and then she started out the back door to do the feeding yeah. herself. Yeah. And no more than she got outside and a shot come from the edge of the woods, and down she went with a bullet through her brain. It killed her. Dead as a dog. But who done it? Well, that low-flung husband of hers done it. That's who? He must have followed her down to Snake Doctor's and then just laid in wait for her. They certain twas him then. Why, huh? sure thing. Snake Doctor jumped up when he heard the shot and he catched a quick look at Jafe over the fence. He did. Yeah, there was a long streak on Kizzy's arm where he must have whooped her at during the day. Well, hanging's a sight too good for him to catch him. No, but they will. Some thinks that he's made for the slashes and hid out there. Tracks led off that away. Uh huh. Oh, there'd be a line of men throwed all the way around Little Cypress for Sunday. Sheriff got there yet? No, but he's due any minute with his pack of dogs. A telephoned in from Gallup Mills that he's on his way. That trail ought to lay good, ground being damp like it is. Sure should. Old Snake Doctor, he's crying on and raving around up at Mourner's Place that the Lord's going to strike the murder down his track. <laughs> I'm putting my main confidence in them bloodhounds. Uh, on them first, and then maybe on the stout plow line and a limb of a tree. Yeah, it's more certain. <laughs> yeah, I'm just putting out for my place to fetch my oldest boy. I wouldn't want him to miss a lynching. Uh, there's a good side crowd up there already. I'll go up and join him. I got a pistol here on my hip pocket. Poor Miss Morner. She always was Kizzy. a good-hearted, hard She's working. dead. A shot Kizzy. Did you hear something just there? Huh? Oh, I can't say I did. Uh, probably a rabbit breaking through the brush. Yeah, listen, listen. Huh? Sheriff's are coming. You can hear them hounds of his, and I got to hurry. Get up there, Bessie. I'll see you back tomorrow. Why, well, you sure will. Jafe didn't have time to waste Mon and his dead wife. He was even a little relieved to know that the snake doctor wasn't the devil incarnate. He had a chance against a lynch mob and a pack of bloodhounds. This was the kind of antagonist he could understand and outsmart. Jave's imagination went to work again as he backtracked along the creek bottom in the spotty moonlight. Gotta throw them dogs off the trail. Gotta wade the creek, even if it is full of cotton mouths. <coughs> they must be all around me now. The folks says they don't strike in the water. Well, I hope them folks is right. Gotta get back to the snake doctors. Get his money while he's still up at my place with Kizzy's remains. And get his money, then the rest would be easy. Make for the deep timber. Cross country to the river. Make it by tomorrow sundown. Hire a shanty boater to ferry me to the Arkansas side. And get a haircut and catch a train for some of else. But gotta get Snake Doctor's money first. Snake Doctor's cabin was dark and empty when Jafe reached it, and he needed light for his search. There were a few dull embers in the fireplace he threw on some kindling, but it didn't light. Very well, he knew where the chink was. He'd find it in the dark. He scrabbled at the logs, felt some bark give, felt the clay mortar crumble under his fingernails. Here it was, a hole big enough for a man's arm. He plunged his hand into it, touched something slick and smooth, and then something sharp plunged into his thumb. <laughs> The fire flickered to life. Jafe yanked his hand out of the hole, saw two tiny bleeding punctures in his thumb. At the mouth of the hole stretched the wide open jaws of a cotton mouth. It worked fast. He felt the pain leaping from his thumb to his hand, seeping up his arm. If he only had some liquor, if he had a fresh killed chicken to slap on the wound, he had nothing. Then a sharp, horrible pain wrenched his heart, and a second... And there in the firelight, the huge cottonmouth poised in its crevice. <laughs> Jafe leaped out of the shack and started blindly for the timber, staggered, stumbled, and pitched forward on his face. His open mouth full of weeds and muddy grass stems. The cramping fingers of his outstretched right hand almost touching a reddish black smear on the wet, trampled grass. <laughs> Good riddance, I'd call it that, wouldn't you, Dr. Bradshaw? Well, I reckon there's sort of a rough justice in the way he died. Uh, look, look, his hand reaching out just about touches the blood where his woman fell. Eh, this has been quite a night, Davis. I've just examined the body of a man who appears to have been killed by snake bite. Killed good and quick, too, judging by the evidence. Well, Doc, ain't that the way a cotton mouth always does kill a man, sudden like? I always heard tell that... Never mind what you heard. I'm going by the facts. 
I've been practicing medicine in this county for going on to 46 years. And I tell you that in all my life, I've never known but two or three people actually being bitten by water moccasins. And until tonight, I never had the personal knowledge of anybody dying from a bite of any kind of a snake. Well, is that a fact? Hey, what's going on over there, Doc? Uh, uh, is that mourner's boy kicking up the fuss? Yeah, he's a no good, just like his pa. Uh, what's your trouble, Tip? I'm gonna kill the snake and bitten my pa. Man, I'm gonna give that old snake doctor a whooping for keeping a reptile in this place. Your pa got just what was his due, Fanny. Snake doctor ain't to blame none. He's a hoodoo devil. Now, look -a here, boy. Uh, Mr. Rives promised all his savings. Nearly a hundred dollars to pay for burying your ma decent. Now, that's how much he thought of her. Now, now, go on home, behave yourself. Yeah, go on, Penny. Ain't Somebody no ought to kill that reptile and yeah, bit my yeah. paw, and I'm going to do it. Hey, Doc, just a minute ago, you started to say something about snake bite not killing. Uh, how you account for Jafe here? Well, the late Jafe Mourner had a rotten, bad heart, Davis. Oh, he sure did. Yes, it proves that. No, I don't mean in that sense. I mean there was an organic weakness. A curious thing, though, there was no swelling anywhere. Well, there's them two marks on his thumb, them snake gashes like some I've seen. Now, that don't explain how... What's... Hey, it's Benny Morton. He's in the cab. That fool kid. Come on, Doc. He's probably shot somebody. I shot at it. I shot at it, but I didn't hit it. It's going to get me like it got my ball. Hey, come I'm on, Doc. Come on. He said he was... He shot at something in the cabin. All right. I don't see anything. Oh, Finney's had enough happen to him yesterday to upset even a bright boy. So we can... Oh. Oh, there it is. Uh, what? A that cottonmouth up there in the hole that log. Oh, oh, that. The snake doctor told me about that varmint. Uh, look at him closer, David. Oh, no, sir, he not uh, me. Go no, ahead, I... go ahead. It's just a stuffed snake. St uh, stuff? Yeah. Snake doctor believes in precautions... Because that hole's where he hides his money. That snake could scare anybody away who didn't know it was stuffed. But just to be sure, old snake doctor lined the hole with coils of barbed wire. Ah. Uh, oh. Oh, oh, I see. You think that them marks on Jeff's thumb was, uh, was got off of the barbed wire, huh? It could be. Lots stronger hearts than Jeff mourners would have stopped beating at a scare like that. Well, I'll be sweet. Oh, Snake Doctor's a cute one, ain't he? Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson, has brought you Snake Doctor by Irvin S. Cobb, adapted for radio by Fred Howard, who also played Doc Bradshaw. With Bill Conrad as Jafe, Paul Fries as Finney, Ruth Parrott as Kizzy. Barton Yarborough played Davis. Louis Van Ruten played Snake Doctor and Tip Bailey. The original musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhrer. Next week... You are alone in a remote old world village inhabited by cat people. And you are desired by a beautiful cat girl who wants your soul. Next week, we escape with Algernon Blackwood's eerie story titled Ancient Sorcerers. Good night, then, until the same time next week when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System.